All right, very good. Well, let us begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon us this evening. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for calling us to yourself, for the journey that you are taking us on, as we seek to please and praise you in all things, as we seek to hear your voice calling us so that we can truly live out the vocations in our lives that you have called us to, the vocations that we will learn about this evening. Open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us so that as we come to know you more, we can serve you better and love you more faithfully. We ask you to hear and answer all of these prayers as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Alright, so we are going to learn this evening about sacraments of vocation, holy orders, and holy matrimony, marriage. So, uh, so I'll just go uh, start briefly over uh, talking a brief overview of holy orders. Now in holy orders... There are three levels of holy orders. So you have a bishop, priest, and deacon, as you see there on the board. The first step is to is uh, first step in holy orders is diaconate, uh, and Lee's going to talk a little more about uh, that later uh, with you. And then the priesthood and the bishop. So, starting at the top, the bishop is the fullness of holy orders. And a bishop is a successor of the apostles. So, the apostles were the first bishops ordained by Jesus himself. And then those bishops, the apostles, then laid hands on other men and ordained them bishops, who ordained other bishops, and on and on to our current uh, bishops today, and to our Holy Father. Um, and so the apostles today, and our Holy Father, who is called the Bishop of Rome, uh, he's the chief bishop of the church, um, as St. Peter was the chief uh, bishop of the church, the head of the apostles. So the Holy Father is the successor of St. Peter, and all bishops today are the direct successors of the apostles. So that's pretty awesome. Um, to be able to go back and see an unbroken line of succession. So that's what we call apostolic succession. And a bishop is the shepherd. So each diocese, so the church uh, throughout the world and each country is split up into different dioceses. So there are different uh, territories. So like Ohio uh, has uh, different dioceses throughout the state of Ohio and each state, like West Virginia, is the Wheeling Charleston diocese? It is the entire state is one diocese. So de depending on what the situations and the needs are, um, the church is, is split up into those territories, and each of those territories, each diocese, has its own bishop, the chief shepherd of that diocese, and that's why the bishop has a crozier, which is basically like a shepherd's staff, a sign of his authority, a sign that he is a shepherd, and on this handout here, there's a picture of a bishop on the inside uh, holding his crozier, and the hat that he's wearing, the funny pointed hat, that's called a mitre, and also a sign of his authority as, uh, as a bishop and shepherd. So then as the church grew, uh, there was a need for uh, helpers for the bishop, and, uh, and so priests were ordained to be representatives of the bishop. Um, like in our diocese, there's a five-hour drive from, one top, from the top to the bottom, so it's a pretty large geographical area. So our bishop isn't able to be 
um, everywhere and uh, be able to celebrate Mass with everybody throughout the diocese every day. So, uh, so there's a need for, uh, for helpers of the bishop and those who represent the bishop and those are the priests. So Father Mike and I represent um, the bishop to all of you and uh, as soon as we get a bishop we'll continue to, to do that. So we keep praying for our new bishop, whoever he may be. And then uh, the deacon is the, uh, as, as Lee will talk about, he is a servant and helper as well. And the very word for deacon uh, means to serve. So, uh, so I was first ordained a deacon, and then I was ordained a priest. And those that are ordained a, a, a bishops, you know, are first ordained a deacon, then a priest, then a bishop. So that's how that goes, and that's why the bishop is the fullness of, of holy orders. In the sacrament of holy orders, just like baptism and confirmation, there is an indelible mark uh, placed on our souls. So all of us uh, who are baptized have that indelible mark on our souls that can never be erased. Uh, that we are sons and daughters of God, and when we receive confirmation, we also, again, receive an indelible mark. And that's why we only receive those sacraments once. Uh, so the same for holy orders. So a priest is a priest forever. Uh, in the order of the line of Melchizedek, as we hear in the scriptures, uh, especially in the book of Hebrews. So, uh, so that's, that's pretty awesome. And uh, as I wrote up here as well, this, uh, this little quote that's also in in the black and white handout that you have. It says that holy orders is a call, neither a right nor a career choice. And that's, uh, and that's very important. It is a call, as we're going to talk about this evening. Um, we're all called to a vocation. So a vocation is God's calling to us how he desires us to live our lives so that we can grow in holiness, so that we can be the best people we can be, so that we can be the saints that he calls us to be. And, uh, and that's what a vocation is. So a vocation isn't simply a career choice um, that, you know, I want to do this or that uh, to make a living. Uh, it's much, much deeper than that, much, uh, much deeper. And in that vocation, then, there can be many different ministries uh, for priests, religious, uh, as we'll learn about next week, um, uh, as uh, those called to marriage, uh, then, of course, they can work in different professions to help provide for the family. Uh, so those all come under the canopy of vocation. And in the Roman church, uh, priests are celibate. So they, uh, they don't marry and have a wife and have sex sexual relations with her and have children. Uh, but that happens on a spiritual level. So closely imitating and following Jesus, uh, who himself was not married. So we uh, strive to emulate him you know, the, uh, as closely as possible. And so that's a tradition way from the beginning of the church. Uh, even though most of the apostles were married and, and uh, probably had children, uh, once they followed Christ, there's evidence that they pretty much left their families behind. I'm sure they saw him from time to time, but they gave up a lot as they followed Christ. And so that tradition has been uh, really from the beginning. Um, as I think we covered a little bit before, in the Eastern Church, uh, we learned about that not too long ago, um, the, the priests are allowed to be married. They can uh, uh, be married and then be ordained. But once they're ordained, then they would no longer uh, be able to be married. So, uh, so that's a uh, discipline in the Eastern Church. And so there are married priests, but in the Roman Church, uh, our priests are celibate. And I really see that as a gift, as a blessing, um, to be able to truly uh, be all that I can be to, uh, to my bride, who is the church, all of you. So Jesus laid down his life for his bride, the church, and so priests, uh, in imitation of Christ, being conformed to Christ through the sacrament of holy orders, um, our bride is the church as well. And so, so that's pretty awesome. So be able to you be there. Uh, to be all things for all people, as St. Paul says. Uh, and that's really a gift that celibacy allows us to be able to, to do that. And that's also why I wear a wedding ring. And the collar is also like a wedding ring, a visible sign of 
being com completely dedicated and given to Christ and his church as a priest. So, so that's pretty awesome. Very good. So that's just a, a quick overview there. Um, I'm going to have you uh, watch a, a little video that has uh, several different priests and seminarians are asking them questions about the priesthood, and I think that will maybe answer a lot of questions that you have, uh, maybe give you some other insights as well. So we'll do that next, and then, uh, and then later on, if you have any questions, you'll be able to, to ask those. Hello, and welcome to Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland. We're gathered today with seminarians from Mount St. Mary's Seminary and faculty to talk about the nature of the priesthood. With me today is Father Brett Brennan from the Diocese of Savannah, the Vice Rector of the Seminary, and our Rector, Monsignor Stephen Ross of the Diocese of Peoria. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Who has the first question today? Deacon. Monsignor, how do we understand or see the priesthood as different than just any normal, um, any normal occupation, but as a vocation instead of just a, a job? Okay, uh, some people think of the priesthood as a career. But it's not a career, is it? No, it's, a, it's a, a call from God to be something and to do something with our life. Uh, it's a sort of an integrating vocation uh, in the sense, as the Holy Father said recently, everyone has a project uh, planted in them by God to be something and to do something to affect the world in which we live. And the priesthood is that vocation which helps people to see their life project, to see things the way God sees them, uh, to be in relationship with him, and in the end to learn how to love the way they love in heaven, which is really what redemption is about. And it's a call to be in relationship to him in a specific way for the sake of the kingdom of God. Do you think that uh, careerism is a problem in the priesthood? Uh, not nearly as much as it used to be. Uh, you had careerists, uh, especially when the church was at the pinnacle of society. Um, but uh, uh, recently, we have not been at the pinnacle of society. And uh, the good news is uh, that uh, most of the time, careerists are sort of uh, filtered out of that because... Uh, uh, it's not something that everyone honors anymore. It's something that uh, you do precisely because God is calling you to do it and not because there is a lot of honor and benefit to it, uh, worldly speaking. When I was in the Navy, we used to have a, a campaign. It was a recruitment campaign saying, the Navy, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. And that was a conceit because, to be honest with you, a lot of time the job the Navy seemed like just a job. But with the priesthood, it's more than just an adventure though it's venturous, it is, it is a calling, and it's a way of life, and it's a way of loving. You're called to be in a relationship with Jesus in a particular way uh, that allows you to serve God's people the way Monsignor described. How about another question? Mm -hmm. uh, with this calling, what do you say would be the chief virtue for a priest in this day and age? That's a good question. Father Brett, you want to start with that? Sure. Um, what we need is, is well-balanced men in the priesthood today. We need men who, obviously, who love the Lord Jesus and who love the church. But we need men who are, are kind and patient and, um, you know, they're, they're well integrated in themselves enough that they're not having to spend all their time worrying about themselves or able to serve others. Because our objective is to bring Jesus to other people. We need men who are prayerful. We need men who spend time with the Lord because we can't bring what we don't have. And so I think that's a, a, a crucial part, is our priests have to be holy, something that we stress very much in Mount St. Mary's. And I think they also have to want to do what God wants them to do. Uh, they have to have a docility of spirit in the sense that uh, uh, you have to be able to go before the Lord and say, whatever you want me to do, I'll be happy to do it. And uh, that is in regards to your vocation your vocation to the priesthood, what your ministry ministry will be after you're a priest, and um, what it is you do each day. You have to have a true docility that says, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. Let me know what it is. I agree totally with uh, what they've said, and I would only add uh, the virtue in today's day and age of courage. I think the call to priesthood today in uh, North America 
is a, a calling that requires heroic courage. Because there are so many obstacles to being a good priest. There are so many uh, temptations in other directions. And so many people would want to say, well, go ahead and be a priest, but just don't be too, uh, too vocal about it. You know, because the call to holiness, the call to sanctity, is a call to conversion. And our society right now is going in directions that are not in accordance with the gospel. So we're calling people out of their, their comfortableness. And that takes a great deal of courage. When I teach preaching uh, to the third year theologians, one of my slogans with them is, remember, the role of a preacher is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <clears throat> That takes a great deal of courage, both to get in there with those who are poor and abandoned, and to be compassionate, to suffer with them and for them. And it takes a great deal of courage to challenge those who may be uh, in need of being moved a little bit closer to the ideal. And I think also you have to have the virtue of prudence, which is a very difficult virtue to acquire. Um, prudence in the priesthood is knowing when to teach what and the way in which to teach uh, what people need to know. Uh, people need to know so many things that are so ill-catechized today, uh, very often not through any fault of their own, it's just the way society is. And so, as a priest, trying to bring them the good news of who and what they are supposed to be, you have to say, well, I want to get to this, but before I get to this, I need to address this. Exactly. And uh, that's a very important thing for uh, a priest to know how to do almost instinctively. It, it doesn't do any good to preach the really hard sayings of the Lord which need to be preached unless they also understand who and what they're supposed to be in the first place. So to talk about uh, a specific type of sin before they even understand what sin does to my relationship with the Lord uh, is just spinning your wheels. It's so. so one of the things we always say is that uh, as priests we must be totally Catholic and totally kind. And we have to let people know how much the Lord loves them and, uh, and try to build them up. And then once they realize how much God loves them, He sent His Son Jesus to die for us, then we can teach them the teaching of Christ and they can embrace it. You know, we always say people don't care how much they know, how much you know until they know how much you care about them. So I think that's a real important part of being a priest, right. is kindness. And that's what St. Paul was getting at when he said, oh, above all these virtues, put on love. Amen. That has to, to be the lead. How about another question? Okay. John Daniel, uh, before you ask your question, though, I asked you before the show to tell us how you came into the seminary and how you discovered your call to the priesthood. Well, I have to think, um, it probably all began with my mom and dad. Uh, I think I, like a lot of young Catholic boys, um, Parents took me to church every week when I was growing up as a kid. I, I remember uh, learning how to serve at the altar in third grade, uh, walking across the street from school and going during the, during the week. And I had a real Sammy pastor. Um, I've had a lot of really amazing priests in my life. But um, for the longest time, my faith never really was my own, you know. Um, I grew up in high school and didn't go to Catholic school, went to public school. But, you know, the faith was always taught at home. We would pray the rosary during Lent and Advent and things. Um, but I depended on my parents a lot for that. You know, it was their gift to me, and I understood that, but didn't really have a lot of interest in it. And so when I got to college, I went to a, a secular college, and um, kind of my first taste of freedom, and I, I left the church. I stopped going and uh, had a, a taste of secular life and the college life, and I kind of lived that way for four long years. But afterwards, um, I began my career as a teacher, and my degree as a secondary ed teacher started teaching and coaching, working with kids, and uh, sports have always been a big part of my life, as you know, with the, the soccer team here at the seminary that I've been involved with for the last six years. Um, and I realized that in, in working with kids and, and, and teaching and coaching, I enjoyed it very much, but there was, there was something more than academics and sports that I felt I was supposed to be sharing with them, something more important. But I couldn't exactly put my finger on it. Um, and the reason was because I didn't have an answer to the question of faith in my life. I was 23 years old, and I wasn't really sure what I believed, and more importantly, why I believed it. So I started investigating, and I read stuff, Christianity, Buddhism, uh, some Eastern religions, and um, 
I was looking for truth. And what brought me to Christianity was the fact that truth was not a concept, it was a person. And I couldn't have a relationship with just a, a bunch of ideas, but I could have a relationship with a person. And that was very, very attractive to me. And that's what brought me back to Christianity. Now, what brought me back to my Catholic faith was, um, as I was praying and reading the scriptures, um, discovered the beauty and the power of the Eucharist, and uh, began going to daily Mass. Um, and my, my dad and mom both go to daily Mass now, and, and uh, their example was always very strong for me. But uh, as, an, as, a, as a young adult, beginning my life, that was the very center of what I did. Um, I would start my day stopping at the church. I couldn't attend Mass because I had to be at work as a teacher at 8.30, and Mass was at 8.30, so I'd go to, Ma go to the church at 8 o'clock and talk with the priest, receive communion, and then I'd go to church and, or go to work and, uh, and, and work with the kids all day. And the strength that that gave me, um, I was working at that point at a homeless and runaway teen shelter uh, up in Vermont, and working with kids whose lives were just destroyed. So, um, the strength that he gave me in that made me want to give my life for him. That's how, that's but how but I'm glad you mentioned also the soccer. Yeah. The rector wants to mention that we're reigning rector's champion <laughs> in the uh, soccer among the seminaries. What's your, what's your question? My question was, uh, why does it take so long to become a priest these days? I don't know if it was always that long or how long was it for you? You already had your college degree. Yeah, uh, four years of, of college undergrad, but then I had six years here at the Mount. Mm -hmm. So it's ten years uh, all said and done. Yeah. Rector, why do we have uh, such a long preparation? Because it takes that long to mold a mind, uh, especially from the secular to the, to the, uh, to the faith-based mind. Um, when I entered, I entered in high school, uh, and in those days it wasn't odd at all to go into high school seminary for four years, then to college seminary for four years, and then to major seminary for four years. So conceivably, you could uh, go in after eighth grade and come out 12 years later as a priest. Lifers. Lifers. Sometimes in the same institution. You came in one end of the institution, and 12 years later, you came out the other end of the institution. Uh, now, most guys don't, don't have that uh, training. Uh, most, like John Daniel, went to a secular college. Many didn't even go to Catholic schools. And uh, so it's a much more intensive program. Uh, two years of pre-theology in which you basically learn how to think, uh, how to construct an argument, how to see other people's arguments, uh, how to state an intellectual position, how to persuasively present it, uh, and then four years of theology in which you have to learn systematics, moral theology, or dogma, moral theology, scripture, pastoral theology, sacramental theology. You have to learn how to administer the sacraments, how to hear confessions, how to preach. Uh, I mean, it's a marvel that uh, we're able to do what we do do in six years. And uh, I really always, as I always tell the men with all the breaks they get, <laughs> it's an even more marvelous <laughs> well, The goal is to, to think with the mind of Christ. Right? Right. To, to, to think with the mind of Christ, uh, as in Terry Kumaklesi, to think with the mind of the church. And that formation takes both the intellectual formation, but also the human and the pastoral uh, and the spiritual formation. Right. Father Greg, you might want to speak to those. Sure. Um, it's not just an academic exercise, though we certainly have to know the teachings of Christ and the church. Uh, and be able to articulate that clearly to the people at whatever level they are, but we have to know Jesus himself, which means we have to be men of prayer. We have to spend many, many hours on our knees with the Eucharistic Lord, and um, we become like him in that way. And we have to develop our pastoral skills. We have to know how to visit people in the hospital, as Monsignor said. How do you approach people in, at different, when they're themselves, like, like Nick and John Daniel said, different places in their faith, and how to gently bring them back to the fullness of, of our faith. Um, so all of these four pillars have to be present to get the final product. And it takes a while to develop yourself spiritually. That's why you have a spiritual director in the seminary. 
uh, someone that you can be totally honest with, who knows your situation, knows where you came from, uh, knows your life story, knows your strengths, your weaknesses, and is able to help you come closer to the Lord. And uh, that just doesn't, it's not like a recipe. Uh, you have to, you know, you have to be in the oven a while. Uh, and uh, in your case, it's six years uh, or four years, depending upon your, your college education. I've got another question. Yes? What is chaste celibacy, and why does the church require a priest to be celibate? It's a good question. When you're uh, approached directly around uh, the question of why priests in the Western tradition are celibate, uh, the church in the Western uh, right has always felt that uh, that a priest ought to be someone who is single-mindedly in love with the Lord. You have to be able, as part of your duties as a priest, to help people learn how to love the way they love in heaven. And your celibacy, your priest celibacy, is a witness to that fact that uh, I don't look at anyone as an object, but I look at everyone as a brother and sister in Christ. And that uh, I can devote myself wholeheartedly uh, to loving the Lord and to loving other people and leading them into the kingdom. And so I am celibate, the priest is celibate, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of bringing that kingdom to fruition uh, in this world. Brother Brett. Yeah, I think I see more and more of our young men um, who really come, and though always it's a struggle uh, to you know, come to terms with that, celibacy has to be a gift from God. Um, and yet, I think more and more of our seminaries these days are, are, are happy to embrace it. They want to embrace apostolic celibacy, and they see the wisdom of the church and the tradition and, and bringing souls to Christ, you know. And it's heroic, but that's exactly what the priesthood is, as you said earlier. We've got to live heroic lives to bring souls to Christ. And I think people know that. And that's an important thing, too, is that it's, it's a tragedy and I always tell them in this, it's a tragedy to try to live celibacy, which is a heroic witness, with an ordinary prayer life. You have to have a heroic prayer life, by worldly standards, to live a heroic witness of celibacy. And to get men to understand that there has to be a, a tremendously deep prayer life to be able to support that heroic witness which the Lord uh, specific, specifically asks you to do if you're called to be a priest. Um, that's an important idea to understand and to come to grips with and to make your own. You know, uh, there are plenty of, uh, the, these spiritual reasons are the most important, but I think uh, my, in my own priesthood, the day that it struck me that it was just essential in our current situation for priests to be celibate was when I was pastor of a very poor parish in a very tough neighborhood in Peoria. Um, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning, it was freezing outside, it was sleeting, and I was pounding on my door. And it turned out to be some women who were, let's say, exercising an old profession. Uh, and it was so cold, they were freezing to death. Uh, and they needed help. They needed help that evening. And I was thinking to myself as I was getting them to the sisters to get the help they needed from the good sisters who would take care of them. I, if I had been married at that moment, if I had a wife and children, if, if a child had been sick, I would have had to have paid attention to them and given them my focus and attention. But at that moment, I had that kind of apostolic freedom that those women became my daughters. They were my family, and I had to do what was necessary to serve them and to, to be there for them. And that might not be possible if I had those other commitments, which are good commitments, but not what the priest is called to. I think the spiritual paternity is such an important part of it as well. You know, we vocation directors, one senior and I both were vocation directors for many years. One of the lines we often use is, while it's true that no one will ever call us daddy, thousands call us father. And that's very true. We have children. We have spiritual children. And our job is to bring them to the father. And that's a great privilege. Right. And in the end, each man who is called to be a priest is also convinced that celibacy is the way that God calls him to love the Lord. Uh, in the end, I am celibate, and you are celibate, because we are convinced that 
that's the way God wants us to love him. It is part of the call. It's the call to love the Lord in a specific way in order to put ourselves at the disposal of the Lord and the church in a specific way. So each person is called to celibacy, each man is called to celibacy before he's called to be a priest. That's why you take your, your promise, your vows of celibacy before you're ordained. And only after that do you, are you ordained a deacon and then a priest. There's many models for the priesthood. You know, the Good Shepherd is an excellent model for the priesthood. But I have found the one that works best, in, for, especially for diocesan priests, is the fact that we are fathers of a very large and usually very poor family. And, and that's the privilege that God gives us. He does give us that hundredfold uh, of children, since we forgo having children ourselves. And he gives us a spouse, the church. And we are to, to, to cherish her and to love her and to lay down our lives for her. We do have a woman to protect, a woman to cherish, a woman to love. It's Holy Mother Church, and we are to, to love that way and to be men of the church. It's an important part of what it means to be a priest, especially in today's day and age. And part of the spirituality of celibacy and the priesthood is that you have to develop your prayer life uh, to the degree that the time you would have spent with your wife, you spend with the Lord. The time you would have gone home and say, you know, how was your day? Uh, you go into the chapel, especially if you have one in the rectory, over to the church, and you just spend some time with the Lord, telling him how the day went. Now, of course, he already knows, but it's important that uh, you tell him, and not that he knows just because he's all-knowing. You need to tell him because you are the one who is in a relationship with him, a relationship of love. I remember um, Father... Minocchio, Father Tony Minocchio was a legend at Mount St. Mary's Seminary as spiritual director for, for many, many years. And he once told us a story. It just it was Thanksgiving. He had been with his family all day and all his nieces and nephews and great meal and a wonderful time. And late at night, he drove back to the rectory. And when he got to the rectory, everything was, all the assistants were gone. It was pitch black and dark. And he went in and he just kind of felt a, a pang of loneliness. And... Um, he went before the Blessed Sacrament, as he was trained to do, and he knelt, and he just said, Jesus, I feel lonely. And he said, we heard the Lord say to him, you belong completely to me. And he said, that really transformed him. He said, that's what I want. I want to belong completely to Jesus. And that's what we can say as priests. And it's a great privilege to be called to do that. How about another question? Monsignor. Yes. Next year, I'm going to be going into theology, and I'm going to start wearing clerics, and people will see me in public, and that's going to change things for me. Why is it important that priests wear the collar, the religious garb? That's a great question. A lot of people have, uh, uh, at one stage, when we were younger in our priesthood, this was a big controversy. I think people are coming back to this. But why does the church ask us to wear distinctive garb? What does it symbolize? It, first, it gives a personal witness of who and what I am, and second, it alerts other people to who and what I am. Uh, it reminds people of a dimension of their life, a dimension of the world that often they forget. Uh, when I travel, for example, uh, quite often when they see me going down an airport terminal or railway terminal, they'll stop and say, Hi, Father, or, are you a Catholic priest? And it, it's an aid to the apostolate. Uh, it should never become uh, a hindrance to the apostolate. I mean, I wear my my clerical garb because it helps and it displays before the world who and what I am. Well, I often think that, you know, when people see us walk in, it makes them think about Jesus. They know we're priests of Jesus Christ. Now, they may not have a relationship with Jesus. They may, they may have a hatred for God or for Christ, but at least they think about him and that gives an opportunity for grace to work. Mm -hmm. But like Monsignor, many times I'm stopped and uh, people just open their hearts immediately. They trust me because, as a priest, I represent Jesus Christ and altar Christus. And so we want to be an instrument of Christ in that way. Right. I remember when I was a seminarian, especially as a convert, I didn't grow up around religious sisters. And we were visiting some Franciscans back in my diocese of Peoria. And when I walked out with another seminarian, he said, you know, when I'm with the sisters, I just feel like I I'm in, in a little bit of heaven. And I'm reminded of heaven. And, uh, of course... Uh, their religious habit and the way they lived their lives. They were hospital sisters, the way they served the poor. This was a witness to the hope that is within us, the witness to heaven, uh, the witness to another life other than this life. The black for us represents that we in a way died with Christ to this life 
and are looking forward to that life that is eternal. Absolutely. And I think that's important. And you say about airports, I, I, I know now as a priest, uh, I'm often asked to hear confessions in the strangest of places. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, the clerics remind people, give them that opportunity uh, when they may feel the, the move of grace to uh, want to confess their sins. Yeah. How about for yourselves, for those who you know, have been wearing clerics, some of the deacons uh, and seminarians, have you been approached, have they given you an opportunity to do the apostolate? For you, John, Peter. Okay. 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 Yeah, I'm Absolutely. Uh, even just stopping you know, up at Walmart, coming back from our, our weekend assignments, and picking, doing some shopping, you know, um, picking up some things, and people just look at you differently. And just like you were saying, Father, uh, you, you can tell that they're thinking about God. It's like, wow, there's a priest in Walmart. That's kind of odd, but, <laughs> but you know that, that God, it's an opportunity for God to work in their life. Great. We've been today talking about the nature of the priesthood and the wonders and the mystery of the call to follow Christ as holy priests. Please join us again from Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland, as we discuss with faculty and seminarians about the future of the church, the nature of the priesthood, and the call to follow Christ. All right. There was an elderly man who... Uh, uh, because of his heart, ended up being hospitalized. And as the nurse was getting the information from him at the hospital, um, asking him the regular routine medical questions, she asked him, what is your religious preference? And he said, well, I've always wanted to be Catholic, but no one's ever asked me before. So that's interesting. Um, a lot of you were probably invited uh, to come and check out the church, and that's why you're, you're here uh, tonight. So... Uh, the power of our witness, uh, whatever the vocation that we're called to, is, uh, is, is very, very awesome. So I'm going to turn it over now to, uh, to Lee, and he's going to share with you about uh, the diaconate. Well, we'll talk about the deacon part of it. Uh, what is the diaconate? Well, the diaconate is an order of deacons. And it's one of the holy orders of the Catholic Church, which Father Christopher has already told us. And there's two types of deacons. There's the transitional deacons, which are on their way to become priests. And then there are the permanent deacons, which that will remain deacons for the rest of their lives. Uh, there are three areas of the ministry traditionally associated with the diaconate. The ministry of the word, the ministry of the altar, and the Ministry of Charity. Uh, a little bit on the, uh, the history of the diaconate. As the early church began to grow, and more and more people began to become converted to the new way of Christianity, the apostles laid hands on chosen men. And seeing the various needs of the church, the apostles established the orders of deacons. And this was recorded in the book of Acts, and I'll just, uh, if you want to follow along with me, I'll just go ahead and read where it, where it all began. And it began on uh, chapter 6 with uh, verse 1. And I'll just read through this. At that time, as the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because, they were, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the twelve called together the community of the disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at the table. Brothers, select among you seven reputable men, filled with the spirit and wisdom, whom we shall appoint to this task, whereas we shall devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The proposal was acceptable to the whole community, so they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Precarius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert of Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So that's basically when it all started, right? Right at the very beginning of the early church.
The deacons were called to serve the temporal needs of the church. And that would be the finances, the care of the widows and orphans, and also the sick. The most famous of the deacons in the New Testament was Stephen. He is the first of the seven to be listed in the Acts uh, that I just read in the book of Acts, where he alone is singled out as a man of faith and the Holy Spirit. The story immediately turns to focus on his ministry of preaching, teaching, and working miracles. Seen as a threat to, to the authority at that time, Stephen was arrested and put on trial, where there are many parallels to the end of his life and that of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was stoned to death. He became the first martyr of the young Christian community. Deacons in the New Testament were called by the name the man servant, which Father Christopher mentioned. That's what the term deacons means. Deacon is to serve. They served in leadership roles for the communities. They preached. They tended the needs of the poor. They were accept of exceptional character. In time, their example would carry the word deacon forward to a more specialized role within the church. St. Paul, Paul in his first letter to St. Timothy wrote, Similarly, deacons must be dignified, not deceitful, not addicted to drink, not greedy for sword gain, holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Moreover, they should be tested first. Then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Deacons may be married, but only once. And must manage your children and their households well. And as Father Christopher in what the, the uh, movie was showing about celibacy, that is what happens if after a deacon, if his wife passes away, he becomes celibate. So he can serve the church in a more faithful manner maybe. As the priest in there mentioned on the video, that uh, they had, would have more time to, to serve the, the parish, the community, and not train another wife. <laughs> uh, thus those who serve well as deacons gain good standing and much confidence in their faith in, in Christ Jesus. The early church fathers attest to the fact that the diaconate was one of the first orders established in the hierarchy of the church. By the Middle Ages, by very complex reasons, the diaconate as a permanent ministry disappeared in the Western church. In the Eastern church, the, diacon, the deacons' liturgical roles were fully retained. In the Western church, the diaconate became a stepping stone to the priesthood. The permanent diaconate became less emphasized and was seen merely as a transitional step to the priesthood rather than as a sacramental character calling one to permanent service. The Second Vatican Council restored the permanent diaconate not because of a shortage of priests, but because the permanent diaconate is a part of the rich history of the church which is called to serve. The diaconate is rooted in Christ the servant. Jesus had many titles and functions. He was a teacher, Lord, priest, healer, and forgiver to name a few. But deacons find their integration with Christ through his ministry as one who came to be the servant of all. A deacon is called to be like Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. The sacrament of holy orders confers an indelible spiritual character that cannot be repeated or conferred temporarily. Very much like the one that, was, that you received upon baptism. It imparts a sacramental grace for the, familiar, for, for the fulfillment of a deacon's ministry. The order of deacon has three essential functions. The proclamation of the gospel the service of the liturgy, and an administration of charitable works. 
The deacon may assist the bishop and the priest in a variety of liturgical functions. Deacons may baptize, witness the exchange of vows and blessed marriages, distribute Holy Communion, impart benediction with the Blessed Sacrament, bring the Blessed Sacrament to the dying, read sacred scripture to the faithful and especially proclaim the gospel, preach the homilies, officiate at funerals and burials, administer the sacramentals. The deacon is also called to dedicate himself to other charitable works, particularly within the parish community. Deacons cannot do the following. Celebrate Mass. They cannot consecrate the elements. They cannot administer the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And this is one that is a little bit, could go either way, and that's here confessions. A deacon can hear confessions, but instead of dissolving them, he says, you did what? <laughs> Just a little humor there. <laughs> One who seeks candidacy for the diaconate seeks to lay himself at the feet of the apostles, as did the first seven deacons, offering themselves to service. It is not the candidate who chooses to become a deacon. It is the church, through her ministry to the world, who calls a candidate to service of Christ, the lover of all mankind. Like every grace, a sacrament can be received only as an unmerited gift. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the formation that you go through to become a deacon. A married deacon candidate must be at least 35 years old and no older than 62 in the Diocese of Studentville. And I believe that in some dioceses you can be as old as 65 is the age limit. It takes approximately four years to become an ordained permanent deacon. The application period is approximately two months. A very lengthy application I might add. You have to... Uh, Fill in just about everything that you've ever done and what you intend to do and witnesses of what you have done. So, so it's, it is pretty lengthy. The aspiracy period, which is the period before you get really start into the schooling for a discernment period, which is in the Diocese of Stoneville, is approximately seven months. And then you have a theological formation period, which is three years, and you study basically like the video was telling all the different uh, parts of theology, sacramental theology, ecclesiology, moral theology, uh, canon law. Uh, it goes in quite lengthy, and then you have uh, a practicum period, which... Uh, is starting uh, in the third year, would be basically your fourth year, uh, learning how to do the liturgical part of being a deacon. There are several steps throughout the formation of becoming a deacon. You have the candidacy that you apply for to become a deacon. Then you have the ministry of the lector. And then you have the ministry of the acolyte. And then you have the ordination by the laying on of hands by the bishop. The, uh, we're, uh, if you didn't know, uh, well let me just go on one more thing. The permanent deacon answers directly to the bishop and the bishop can assign the permanent deacon to any parish in his diocese. So you, you bishop is really the boss even though he's told you that sometimes the priests think they are. They're not. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, there's, uh, I'd like to share a little bit of my personal formation experiences with you. If you didn't know that uh, I have not chosen, but I feel that maybe I've been called to, to work to become a deacon, 
and I'd just like to go on how and why I became interested. It was through the RCIA program. They had a deacon, Deacon Dominic, came and did a little presentation, basically a little bit like what I'm doing, only a lot better, uh, that year. And uh, it was like maybe my second or third year of, after I had went through the, uh, the RCIA program. I thought, boy, that, that really sounds good. That sounds very interesting. And uh, after the uh, RCIA, and I helped out, it sponsored several years, and, and then got to become, uh, went through the lecture training and did some lecturing, and then Eucharistic minister, same thing. And uh, it, just, uh, it just felt so fulfilling to be able to serve and, and help the church and the parish in this manner. And uh, they, they were talking about that they were, maybe were going to start a deacon program in a diocese. Uh, as I would read back, uh, Vatican II had reestablished the permanent diaconate, but there hadn't been no, no movement uh, for the diaconate or to, to have deacons in the Diocese of Steubenville since that, and that had been over 40 years that they'd had the, the you know, that they were, it was okay to do, but they hadn't moved on it. And they, they were talking about this. And uh, I thought, uh, you know, that, that really sounds interesting. So uh, about uh, three years ago, they, uh, they came out and uh, said that they were going to start a uh, select uh, uh, class for the diaconate. And uh, I uh, thought about it, and I talked to Karen, my wife, about it. And she said, well, that, that sounds pretty good. So then I went and talked to Father Mike. And I asked Father Mike, I said, you know, I said, is this something that you think that I could do? I said, the only background I've got in the, in the Catholic faith is the RCIA program, and that hasn't been all that long ago. And uh, I know that I'm asking for a lot because I don't have the background of being born Catholic and living my whole life, raising my family, my married life, uh, to that degree. But do you think that that is something that I could do? And he said, yes, he, he thought that I could do that. So we talked about it a little bit, and with Karen's support, I went ahead and applied for the uh, diaconate. And uh, there were uh, several that applied, and they, uh, they took 10 of us from the Diocese of Steubenville. But they said they were only going to take seven, so three would be weeded out. So I figured, well, here's the weed. It's going to get pulled first. <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind. So it turned out that and that was to be decided uh, at the end of the seven months of the aspirancy program. And what they had done, they had made an arrangement with the Columbus Diocese, who was starting a class that already that was going to start the, at the beginning of that year. And they had 12, and they had... Uh, room for uh, seven or eight and uh, so the bishop was going to go ahead and uh, make the call at the end of that year Bishop Common well come the end of the year one had already dropped out shortly after we started the aspirancy portion of the program and uh, so that brought it down to nine so that meant Two of us was going to go, so I figured it'd be old Lee. He'd be get pulled here pretty quick. But uh, anyhow, it, the bishop decided to go ahead, and they made arrangements for uh, for us to go ahead and uh, get ready to go to Columbus. Well, I had one other uh, gentleman uh, that dropped out at that point. He wasn't. He didn't want to go ahead and uh, go and join the the amount of 
time that it would take to go to Columbus. So uh, that brought it down to uh, eight at that point. So uh, they still maybe only have seven. But anyhow, one of the other gentlemen, he dropped out. So uh, I brought it down to seven. And then here in the last year, we had one other one. So now there are only six of us in this program from the Diocese of Studentville that's going through the program. But the one thing that they did do, they assigned each one of us in the diocese, the spiritual director, who Father Mike is my spiritual director, and, and uh, many, many times I've got, as things happen, you have doubts. Am I doing the right thing? Can I even do this? I'll go and talk to Father Mike, and we'll, he'll do a prayer for me, and I'll do some praying, and I'll make it another week. <laughs> Just to be quite honest about it. It's a week-at-a-time deal. And then they assign us also a formation director, and that helps us form our lives and get us molded into what the priest in the video was talking about, get our lives more more in uh, in tune with the faith, I guess you would say. Get us a little, a little bit more away from the secular part, more into the spiritual. And uh, and Father Walker, Father Paul Walker, from the priest at uh, St. James in McConnellsville, is, our, is my formation director. So we meet with them. Each one of us, uh, uh, the candidates, has a different spiritual director and different formation director. So, well... Uh, Dan Murray from Athens actually has the same formation director, Father Walker. So we sort of meet together with him, and he helps us along uh, in our formation of that. We attend. Uh, so that's really how it sort of came about. Got interested, and I gained so much peace of the faith in my heart. Uh, when I became, after I became Catholic, or becoming Catholic, really, and I just love the RCIA program. I really do. Uh, it's hard to believe that you can get enough information from the RCIA program to be able to go to, to a theology school, but it can be done. It's a cram course. You've really got to work at it. I mean, there's nothing easy about any part of it. When they tell you that you're going to have put in a a uh, the test that we take the the uh, not reflection papers but the uh, sort of like a thesis that we that we have done on different parts in the school where you do all your footnotes and all that stuff and get it all together for a young man that would be okay for an old guy like me it is pretty doggone tough. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. So, the, uh, the act of prayer, the faith of prayer, works, I'm telling you. You just got to, you just got to love it. But the theology classes, we go uh, uh, pretty much uh, 18 weekends a year. And that's, sometimes that's every other weekend to Columbus. And then we have formation weekends, and that's Columbus has their formation weekends for their class candidates, and then Steubenville has for the, the six of us. And that's generally four times a year that you we get together for a weekend. We have classes, discuss a lot of different things. And then there's, uh, every year there's a retreat week that you go and you, and you can, some of them we have went and we've had classes and studied. And then other times it's just a week to get away from everything and just pray and get down to what the faith really means to you. And those, those are very good. I mean, when you go for a week and you don't have to worry about the telephone, you don't have to worry about work, you don't have to worry about anything, you just... You just communicate with God that that week, and, and the other the other candidates that are going through, and also the priests that participate in that formation. 
uh, for that week. But uh, one thing that uh, you have to have, and it won't work without it, is the support of your wife. Uh, I hate to say it, but uh, one of the candidates that was in the class, the one of the last ones that dropped out, is in the state of divorce now. And it is tough. I mean, there's weekends that I'm gone, just like this last weekend, my wife was in the, had her knees operated on last Monday. I had class in Columbus Friday night, went up Friday night and Saturday and then come back Saturday night. There's just so many things that you, that you do give up and you can't do it without their support. And, and it, it really is. Plus, all the prayers from everyone that, that uh, is out there to help you. Uh, so, even if I don't make the ordination, I'll never regret any part of it. For my faith has grown so much that I'm a, a control freak, to be quite honest, and to give things over to the Lord was some doing. It just didn't happen. It just didn't happen, to say the least. But uh, if any of you uh, are interested in the diaconate, there will be, I think, and I'm pretty sure that the Diocese of Steubenville is going to have start another class when this one's finished. And uh, it's, uh, it's just great. We are going to have uh, the rite of the acolyte, the installation of the acolyte, February the 4th, so we'll be receiving that at Steubenville at the Cathedral uh, February the 4th. So that's just one more step closer. So, And those are very important. Uh, it's like the, uh, the right of the lector. I was about burnt out. I mean, I, I was just about burnt out, but when we went and they held the right of the lector, that just sort of energized me again for another bout of it, <laughs> to say the least. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a moving experience. Uh, I don't know what I'll be called to do. I know I'll be called to help. And uh, my thoughts were that uh, I'm getting ready to retire here soon. And I couldn't think of a better way to end my life than helping the church and helping others. I intended on being a volunteer, doing something, but this, I think, is, is what I really want to do. And it's not me doing it. As I read it earlier, I don't choose to become a deacon. The Lord's going to choose whether or not I'm going to become a deacon, and probably Father Michael has some say in that, I'm sure. <laughs> But anybody have any questions? I probably went through this a little fast, but I did want to share a little bit about how it all happens, and it's not easy. After the class is Saturday, I've got my doubts whether I can make it even next time. <laughs> so, <laughs> because we have a lot of different instructors, and some of them are pretty intense, <laughs> to say the least. They... Uh, these classes that we take are generally semester classes for the college students, uh, seminarians. They give it to us in six weeks. <laughs> so, so it's pretty condensed, and uh, they think that you don't have anything else to do except to go home and read a book or two <laughs> and be ready for the class come Saturday and know everything there is to know about it. They don't realize I don't think they realize, <laughs> they maybe do, but I don't think they realize that we are working and uh, doing the family thing and all that. But, and one other thing I wanted to share with you was that uh, Karen is doing very well. I just came from the hospital and uh, she's in good spirits. She was able to go up and down four steps today after having two new knees put in a week ago. She's went. Last week was very painful for her, and, and we thank Father Mike. He came up, and I guess he was there today and said he had no sense spending, he had to spend his time with sick people, and, 
he just let her go. She was doing pretty good. So <laughs> she mentioned that to me. But she wanted me to thank everybody for their prayers. And, and it has made a big difference. And I know that we'll be talking about the sacrament of uh, anointing of the sick. Father Mike anointed Karen before the surgery the Sunday before. We could go Sunday. And I know that that had a lot to do with how she's recovering today. She's doing very well. But I want to thank you. Anybody have any questions? If not, I'm going to turn you over to a break time. Thank you. So the, the next part of our vocations uh, coverage, our vocations talks, is of the vocation of marriage. We've already looked at priesthood. We've looked at the diaconate. And um, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about uh, marriage, and then next week we'll look at the religious life and the single life, okay? So, um, so I get the honor of speaking about marriage, the sacrament of marriage, the vocation of marriage. And I have to say, I'm really excited to give this talk, because um, I, I love being married. I, I love the, the, the sacrament of marriage, this, this beautiful calling. It is a beautiful, beautiful gift. Um, Normally we, or always, I don't know when this started, but typically there's a, a married couple that does the vocations talk uh, on marriage tonight. And Janet was supposed to do it with her husband, Ken, and they had to go out of town, so Kathy asked me if I'd be willing to, to do it myself. And I've always wanted to do this talk, but, you know, my wife, I made it very clear that she is in no way coming to speak in front of a crowd, you know, so... <laughs> We, I, I'm, I, she always tells me I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm one person short of a couple for these kind of things. You know, I just, we, you know, she's not going to do that at all. <laughs> you know, I, I like this kind of thing. I enjoy it, but, but it's just not going to go anywhere. So anyway, because Janet's going out of town and I, I have this, this little narrow window, I, this is my opportunity to, to talk about marriage. So I'm, I'm delighted to do that. Um, I've been married as of this last October. I've been married for eight years and we have four children ages 7 to 2, so we're very busy, you know, very full life, um, but um, we, we feel very, very blessed. I, I can't remember if I mentioned it, I don't know why I would have, but um, that in my life I actually very seriously considered um, becoming a priest. Um, I was actually pursuing that. I ended up spending six years in the seminary and discerning that vocation, um, and that's kind of pretty much where I thought I'd be, and then I would think, oh, God kind of works in funny ways, you know, and, and I ended up leaving the seminary, and it really was because I, I, part of why I left, or maybe even a major reason why I left, um, was just learning the beauty of the church's vision for marriage, and just really being captivated by that, and kind of seeing that the Lord was calling me to embrace that vocation. I ended up leaving the seminary, um, and later I met my wife, and she always likes to make it clear that we met after I left the seminary. She didn't, you know, pull me out of the seminary or anything like that. So anyway, um, what I'd like to do tonight with the, the uh, marriage talk is to first give you some information about what marriage is. And this is all coming from the U.S. Bishop's document on marriage, um, their pastoral letter on marriage. It's a beautiful document. As I said, you could read the abridged version if you'd like to. It's, it's, it's short and to the point. Uh, but it has some nice reflections in it. So I, I want to talk to you about what marriage is, the, the Catholic vision for marriage. First on a natural level, just as a, a, as a natural human institution, and then the sacrament of marriage, that deeper spiritual level. And then I'd also like to give you some information, just, just kind of some reflections on, on you know, making marriage work, making it last, you know, kind of the brass tacks kind of stuff. Okay, so um, first thing that I want to look at is what is marriage? You know, what is it? What are we talking about? In 2009, the bishops wrote that pastoral letter I referred to. It's called uh, Marriage, Love, and Life in the Divine Plan. And it has some, it's just an excellent resource for understanding what marriage is all about. Um, there's some really good stuff in there. Uh, one of the key points that the bishops make is that marriage is a gift that God gives us. It's a blessing from God, a gift from God. And they really spell it out and, and try to help people understand this. They, the, this is a quote from them. They actually say, God is the author of marriage. Right? Th that's a really important point, even though you may not catch it. 
God is the author of marriage. Marriage comes from God. It's not something that's made up by society or individuals. It comes from God. If God makes marriage, he's the one who determines what marriage is, how it works, how it's supposed to function. You know, it's not something that can be changed over time by passing fashions and ideas. Okay? God's the author of marriage. So he, the, the bishops actually tell us that marriage in God's design has several essential qualities. That these qualities have to be there for it to be a marriage according to God's design. And they're all captured, you know, in that, in actually the paragraph, it's, on, it's printed on your page there. There's just a, a, a very short but packed full definition for marriage. The bishops say, marriage is a lifelong partnership of the whole of life of mutual and exclusive fidelity established by mutual consent between a man and a woman and ordered towards the good of the spouses and the procreation of offspring. Um, that may sound kind of dry, and I want to go through and explain those different points in there. I think it's kind of interesting. That's based on uh, canon law, the church's law. And um, when I was in the seminary, I actually remember this, uh, the, my last year in the seminary, uh, this funny experience where we were in canon law class, learning different things, and one day, I remember we, we started talking about marriage, and the, the priest professor was kind of teaching about marriage, kind of like you were talking about, Lee, you know, going through all this stuff, and, and he, he read the definition for marriage from canon law, which is, you know, a lot like this, and it's almost identical to this. And I remember at the time, I'm here, I'm, I'm a seminary, and I'm studying to be a priest, you know, kind of discerning that call and everything. And um, I remember looking around at my classmates in, the, in, this, in this room, and I was just thinking, like, just something really touched my heart. Just hearing that very dry definition, I was just like, I just wanted to say, like, wow, that's beautiful. That's good stuff, you know? And I was looking around at the other seminarians, and I, I, I was starting to feel a little odd at this point, thinking, like, okay, you know, is anybody else feeling like that? And, um, you know, looking at them, and, and of course, they, they just were paying attention to class and everything, and all of them are priests now, you know? They're all priests serving the church, and, um, you know, I ended up leaving, and but I, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit was really touching my heart that the church's vision for marriage is, is, is beautiful, it's profound, and, and, um, and I, I, I felt called to embrace that with my, with my wife. Um, but going back to that definition, really like all church documents, there's a lot of stuff packed into that one sentence. There's a lot there. So I want to just try to take it one piece at a time and, and kind of examine that. The very first thing is that marriage is lifelong, okay? Marriage is a lifelong union of the spouses. This is what the bishops teach. This is what we believe. That when a man and woman exchange vows, they, they have to intend to be married for life. You know? And the bishops even teach, in another part, I don't have the quote here, but they even say that when the spouses exchange vows, they form a permanent bond between themselves. A permanent bond. And they can't just say, well, I don't want to be married anymore, and then it goes away. It doesn't work that way. They, they point out, you know, like I said, going back to this idea, marriage is something that God designs. It's a gift from God. When the two people enter into marriage, they form that permanent bond between them, and they can't just take it away. The bishop said something like, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something that, to the effect that um, the spouses can't just, they, it can't be, the bond can't be removed by the will of the spouses or something like that. They can't just say, you know, we're not married anymore. Um, that's why, incidentally, and we're, we'll talk about this more later, but that's why the church has this whole process of an annulment. You know, the, uh, if, if someone, uh, things happen, people's lives, obviously we all know that, and um, marriages don't always last, obviously we all know that. Uh, but the church has a process called the annulment process where they can kind of examine a marriage to determine whether something was missing to, that prevented that marriage bond from taking place, you know. Um, if someone wishes to get married again, if they've been married before, the church always says, well, you know, one of the key things is you have to be free to marry. You can't marry someone if you're already married, you know. And, and the church always says you have to look at that marriage, the church authorities look at that marriage to determine if something was missing from that so that they can determine and declare that the first marriage was null and you're able to get remarried or to actually get married the first time, actually. That's what it technically would be. So... Um, that first thing is very key. Marriage is a lifelong union. The uh, second part of that, going on even with that same uh, sentence there, is the partnership of the whole of life. I, that was a, one of the phrases that really caught my attention when I, when I first started hearing the church teaching on marriage. 
Marriage is an intimate sharing of every aspect of your lives. Emotional, spiritual, physical, social, familial, financial, I mean, etc., etc. It goes on and on and on. Every aspect of your life is something that's shared. In the real marriage, in God's design, nothing is withheld. You know, it's a complete, whole sharing. Um, and the relationship must respect the equal dignity of the spouses. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I, I don't know how many of you know this or not, but I'm actually working to finish my master's thesis, and I'm writing about uh, the church's teaching on marriage and the family. This is what I'm, what I'm doing for my, for my master's degree in, uh, in theology. And in my study, I came across this really cool quote from Pope John Paul II. Actually, it's not John Paul II's quote, cool, but he had this in a document of his. He quoted St. Ambrose on, and this must be some kind of a marriage ceremony, and I don't know the whole context of this, but St. Ambrose has this beautiful quote. St. Ambrose is the one who brought St. Augustine into the church. He baptized St. Augustine, a very key figure. This is in the 4th century, a long time ago. But St. Ambrose says uh, to the husband, you are not her master, but her husband. She was not given to you to be your slave, but your wife. Reciprocate her attentiveness to you and be grateful to her for her love. In God's plan for marriage, the spouses are equal partners. You know, that's, that's the idea. They're equal partners. Uh, that's the partnership of the whole of life. If you guys have any questions, by the way, you can just stop me and ask. Um, the next part of that definition is mutual and exclusive fidelity. When a man and woman enter into marriage, they enter into a unique relationship in the sense that their partnership is like no other relationship. You know, that, that they have this exclusivity between them. Um, and obviously, we all know you can't engage in, you know, physical intimacy with anybody else. You know, I, when you're um, when you're married, you know, that's that fidelity to your spouse. But it's not just that; it's broader than that. You know, if you think about it, you know, the other areas of your life are included in that too, in that fidelity. You know, your spouse has to have the first place in your life, and all this, you know, we we know it. But if you think about it, it's it's kind of common sense, but. It, it's cool to think about it. So your, your spouse has that first place in your life, obviously next to God. Um, and you're called to love and respect your spouse more than any other person. Um, and that's both in, and I'll bring up this later too, both in how you treat your spouse, but how you speak to your spouse also, how you speak of your spouse, you know, when they're not around. <laughs> that's another thing that's really important. So that mutual and exclusive fidelity. Um, it's established by mutual consent. Spouses enter into the covenant of a marriage through the exchange of vows. That exchange of vows is what creates the marriage. It creates the bond between them. These vows have to be freely given and freely received. No one's getting forced into marriage. You know, you can't be forced to marry someone. It's freely given and freely received. That's that mutual, mutual dimension to that to marriage. Um, the bishops put in the in the definition very clearly. It's between a man and a woman. One man and one woman. So that in God's design, marriage is between one man and one woman. And that's it. Period. You know? So that kind of excludes all kinds of stuff. Um, we don't need to go there. But anyway, <laughs> you get the point. Um, the last point there in that definition, it's order towards the good of the spouses and the procreation of offspring. The church recognizes there are two purposes of marriage, or two ends, two goals, two... two um, Two, um, well, two purposes. The uh, first purpose is to assist the spouses in the day-to-day -day living um, in their day-to-day -day lives, to help them to become better people. You know? And ultimately, it really, it's, it's a call to be, to be saints, to be holy, to be good people, to be good Christian people, to be saintly people. You know, that's the first part of it, the good of the spouses. The second purpose of marriage is procreation. Openness to children is an essential aspect of, of marriage. And obviously not every marriage has children. It doesn't always happen that way. But the church points out in God's design that we're always called to be open to the gift of life. You know, that's part of the way God designs marriage and, and sexual intimacy. Um, and we'll talk more about all that stuff later in morality and everything. But, but anyway, that's part of the, the vision for marriage. So putting that, you know, going back to the original statement there, the original paragraph from the bishops. Marriage is a lifelong partnership of the whole of life of mutual and exclusive fidelity established by mutual consent of a man and a woman and order towards the good of the spouses and the procreation of offspring. Okay. Question. Yes. 
You know what? I would like to refer all questions of what is valid and what isn't to Father Mike because he's an expert on marriage and annulments and all that stuff. Anytime we talk about marriage, it is so complicated. Um, so, did you catch that? You wanted to restate it? If a Catholic marries a non Catholic and not be, not a court put together in the church, I say they're married for 40 years or something like that. Would the church ever recognize that as a marriage? Uh, no. If it was never consummated, or, or never not consummated, it's not worth Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was only 20 years. Never blessed. Yeah. They were. It could be dealt with, but it could be Could a Catholic, if there was a reason, could a Catholic, for example, get married by a non-Catholic minister and still be part of the church? Maybe the non-Catholic minister was the uncle of the bride or whatever, and she was the non-Catholic. The bishop could give permission for the non-Catholic minister to be a witness to that wedding. But if a Catholic without permission from the bishop gets married in a non-Catholic church, that is not a marriage. Marriage is so complicated. One of the things that I did not put in here, and maybe Father Mike, you could, could, you, could you spell this out? But one of the things that's not in my notes is I didn't include a lot of the regulations for marriage, you know, that's from, from the Catholic Church. Because I was trying to think of how to, you know, put that in. But one of the one of the regulations is that you know that um, Catholics always are I don't know what the right word is obliged required to be married through the church in and through the church right you know that's so it's as, and it's different like if you're looking at someone someone who's converting to, to the RCA program and they were married somewhere else they weren't Catholic there's some other kind of stuff that applies to that right I mean the church always presumes it's a valid marriage though right. No, that's not. That's the opposite of what I just said. The church recognizes non-Catholic marriages. So sometimes people will, you know, want to come into the church and they've been married before. Well, that is, that's okay because I've been married to a Protestant by Protestant minister who's always Catholic. We recognize that marriage. What I don't recognize is a Catholic who gets married. Uh, outside of the offices of the Catholic Church, were obliged by canon law to be married by a uh, representative of the church. And not married by, but he has to witness the marriage. Right. The priest does not marry a couple. The couple marry each other. But it, According to the Catholic theology, for that marriage to be recognized in the church, if that person is Catholic, a delegate of the church or a delegate you know, of the bishop has to have the marriage. A priest, a deacon, a bishop, or somebody delegated, in the case of a Protestant minister, delegated by the bishop because they have to be to be married. And there has to be a real good reason if you're married for that. It's amazing how complicated it is. I, I was, as I was putting my notes together, I kept thinking, I, in, my, my, in my own mind, I was thinking like, well, what about this? And what if this? And what? And I kind of thought, I thought about saying, well, let, what, I, what I'm trying to do, I'm hoping to do is, is communicate, you know, what is the the ideal. What is the thing that we're looking at just as the, uh, the church's vision for marriage? Sometimes the ideal kind of falls short and that's when you ask Father Mike. <laughs> you just say, like, okay, what about this particular situation? You know, because things are so complicated. It, it, it really just is, is crazy, right? I mean, that from the... Not really complicated. Well, that's true. You know, I, I, <laughs> that's, 
That's that's true. That's true. Well, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. <laughs> point taken. Joseph's 111. 111. 111 rules. Oh, for for marriage. For marriage. 111. Father Mike has them all memorized. Catholic yesterday, they had to bring in a recent copy of a baptismal certificate. Yes. And I had a case one time where they brought in the certificates from when they were baptized. And they said, this is going to do. You have to call the church. And the mother was there, but, you know, carrying on like a lot of mothers. And so I called the church to get a copy. And the pastor said, why would you need a copy of the baptismal certificate that man, his wife and his children are very active. He travels a lot. He's going to have two little families. One in Stubenville and one in Florida. And so when the day that somebody Catholic is married, they write that in the baptismal book of the church where the guy was baptized so that there's no shenanigans. Okay, I want to get back to the, um, yeah. get back, to, uh, sorry, yes. Can I, just to, to oh, sure. To, I'm sorry, to tag on to what I think some of the people might have a question. If they were married outside of the Catholic Church, in another church, by another minister, and they join and become part of this community, what does that mean for their marriage? The Catholic Church recognizes that marriage. Luther marriages, all married, if a couple was married by a JP, and then they decided that they wanted to come and become Catholic. We recognize that marriage because they were not obliged to follow the Catholic rule because they were not Catholic. Catholics are obliged to follow the rule. Non-Catholics are not obliged to follow the rule. Well, that's a good question because Catholics don't understand that. Because we recognize their marriage, then they would have to go through the annulment process before they would be married in the Catholic Church. Yes. That's the reason I brought that up because it's better that it, it, that it be brought up sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Because last year at RCIA, it was almost too late. My wife and I, we've been married a total of 67 years. But not to each other. <laughs> so we found out uh, when her divorce happened, she no longer could take communion. I wasn't even Catholic, so I didn't know what was what. And we found out that we both had to go through a moment before we could be accepted by the church again. Well, could she take communion as long as she never married? Yeah, as long as she never married, she could receive communion. So let's let's get back to the uh, the the handout there, and uh, we looked at the that simple you know packed full definition from the bishops. And there's another part of this, another um, dimension that the bishops point out. Also, I think this quote is under is also on your handout. But the bishops point out that there's a a public dimension of marriage that sometimes gets overlooked. Uh, the bishops write, marriage is not merely a private institution, however. It is the foundation for the family, where children learn the values and virtues that will make them, will make good citizens as well as good, I'm sorry, good Christians as well as good citizens. The importance of marriage for children and for the upbringing of the next generation highlights the importance of marriage for all society. So even though the, the, uh, the spouses have this mutual and exclusive relationship, it's an exclusive relationship, obviously there's very much to it that's very private, the fact that they are husband and wife is not private. You know what I mean? It's a public relationship. It's a public reality. Um, it's a public institution. And it very much affects the whole world around us. Um, Vatican II, one of the statements from Vatican II is that the family is the first and vital cell of society. The foundational to society is the family. Um, and Pope John Paul II pointed this out a lot. That the family is the, the foundation piece of society. The bedrock of society is the family. So, you know, you, you can't really look at marriage as a purely private matter. Sometimes people fall into that trap. Um, we, there really is a responsibility that married couples have to see their marriage as a public institution. That's why, in part, 
that you get married, you know, in a, in a public ceremony. You don't, you know, go and get married privately somewhere. You know, that's not the ideal because it's part of the, uh, the public reality of the church and of society even. Um, okay, so that's, that's actually what the bishops would say is um, marriage on a natural level. The natural level of marriage. A natural marriage. What marriage is by God's design. And that's not just for Christians, really. The church would say that's for everybody. We all share in that, that blessing of marriage. Or, I mean, everybody who's married shares in that. And they need, we all need to conform to God's design for marriage. But there's something that's even deeper. There's another dimension to, that for us as Christians that brings it to a whole new level. And this is the level of the sacrament of marriage. This is the stuff that I think is especially exciting. This is really cool. Um, the church has a, a, a real, I mean, it's just amazing. The, the nobility and the beauty that Christ gives to marriage blows your mind. I th- it's just amazing. So we're going to look at the sacrament of marriage. God gave marriage to the human family at the beginning of creation. That's what the church says. You know, you look back to the scriptures. At the very beginning of creation, with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are the first married couple. They're given to each other by God to have a, a marriage in a real true sense. Original sin deformed the beauty of this gift, but God restored the beauty of the institution of marriage through Christ and raised it to a new level. So Christ comes, and even he talks about this, and you see this in the Gospels. He, he points back and he says, you know, at, at one point where they're talking about divorce, uh, the people ask him, and, and, and Jesus says that Moses allowed them to be divorced, but in the beginning, it wasn't that way. I mean, he's pointing back to the very beginning. This is how God created marriage. Uh, the bishops say, and this quote's probably on your paper too, the sacrament, sacrament of matrimony renews the natural institution of marriage and elevates it so that it shares in a love larger than itself. Marriage then is nothing less than a participation in the covenant between Christ and the church. So, when a Christian couple enters into marriage, they not only enter into a loving, committed relationship with each other, they actually participate in the very life of God. I mean, think how amazing that is. You know, as married couples, we share and participate in God's own life. Marriage is a sacrament of the church. A sacrament of the church. Last week, Kathy talked about sacraments. One of the definitions she gave was that a sacrament is an outward institute, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Okay? An outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Like the other sacraments, Christian marriage is a visible sign that points to and expresses God's love. Okay? But it's not just a sign or a symbol this is the amazing thing about sacraments. They're not just symbols. They're not just rituals. They're not just, you know, um, just something that's, you know, a nice, pleasant thought. Sacraments make real what they symbolize. That's the, the heart of what a sacrament is. They make real what they symbolize. So going back to the bishop's letter again, uh, they spell this out. Marriage is one of the church's mysteries or sacraments. The catechism of the Catholic Church puts it this way. Christian marriage becomes an efficacious sign, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the church. An efficacious sign is one that does not merely symbolize or signify something, but actually, excuse me, actually makes present what it signifies. It makes it real. Okay? Marriage signifies and makes present to the baptized spouses the love of Christ by which he formed the church as his spouse. I'm going to read that last line again. This is so important. This is marriage, you know, the sacrament of marriage. Marriage signifies and makes present to the baptized spouses the love of Christ by which he formed the church as his spouse. I mean, this is incredible. If you, if you sit and think about the, the depth of this, the beauty of this, when I exchanged the vows with my wife, we entered into a covenant relationship. You know, that it wasn't just with each other. But it was also with God. In fact, um, my, um, my mother-in-law um, gave us a special gift for our wedding, which I forgot to bring. And every year I think about this and I never remember to bring it. I don't think I ever brought it. But we have this special wall hanging in our, in our home that was, um, was kind of commissioned by my mother-in-law, someone she knows does this quilting stuff. Um, and there's this beautiful wall hanging, and it has a, a big heart in the middle. And at the top it has our names, and then it says... Marriage takes three, you know, and that's the idea, you know, that when you're married, 
You're, it's not just that you're married to each other as a sacrament. You're united with God. God unites you together. That marriage takes three. And anybody who's n- is married, anybody who is married, knows how true that is. <laughs> you, know, to, you know, you enter into marriage, and to make it work, you definitely need God and God's grace. You know, because it can be a very big challenge sometimes. Okay. So, um, okay, da, 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 I'm getting back to my, my notes here. I want to get sidetracked. So, when we enter into marriage, we are, we are entering into a relationship, a covenant relationship with each other and with God. And, you know, if you think about this, um, when you have two people that are baptized, in a certain sense, we're already united because of our baptism. We're already united as part of the body of Christ. But through the sacrament of marriage, you know, that, that God takes our, our, uh, our natural marriage, the normal uh, bond you would have, and creates a bond in the Lord, a sacramental bond, which is just like it, it really changes everything in your, in your relationship. Um, I like to think, honestly, that, and I think you can say this without being completely off, that in a way, married couples become living, breathing sacraments. I mean, in a way. You know, that, that, that your marriage is a, a living expression of God's love in the world. And the grace is not only given for the couples. This is really important to understand. That the sacrament of marriage is not just for my wife and I, that we share and we have God's grace. It's also given for the church. And I think this is really cool. You can actually see this in the way that the church arranges the uh, listing of the sacraments in the catechism. In fact, you saw this on Kathy's handout last week. In, when they, in the catechism, when they list the sacraments, the, the first three sacraments are called the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. You know, and then they have the next set, the sacraments of healing. You kind of like these are related. You know, the penance and anointing of the sick. Okay, those are healing. The last set, they're called the sacraments at the service of communion, the sacraments at the service of the church. You know, marriage is listed with holy orders as a sacrament that's given for the sake of the church. And the Catechism even spells it out. It says, Holy orders and matrimony are directed toward the salvation of others. If they contribute as well to personal salvation, it is through service to others that they do so. They confer a particular mission in the church and serve to build up the people of God. All Christians receive the sacraments of initiation. That's how we enter into the church. You know? um, and they give us that, the grace so that we can live that life. But I just find it particularly interesting that the church in the catechism links holy orders and marriage together. You know, it's not, you know, I always want to say, marriage is not meant to be a, uh, some kind of a, a self-centered track to personal happiness. You know, marriage is something that is meant to build up the church. You know, that we actually are called as married couples to serve the church somehow, you know, in and through our marriage. Okay? And this really points to the other dimension of marriage, which is that marriage truly is a vocation. You know, we tend to, I think, tend to look at um, priesthood, the diaconate, religious life. We kind of look at those things and say, wow, I can see how God would call someone to that. But that's not for me. I, just, I think I'll just be married <laughs> or something. You know, I mean, uh, I think that really falls short of the, of, the, of the vision of marriage that God gives us, especially in Christ. Um, you know, the, the bishops talk about how God is the author of marriage. You know, we looked at that already. God's the author of marriage. You know, and it's something that's fascinating, in a certain sense, God isn't only the author or creator of marriage in the beginning, the original creator of marriage. In a certain sense, God is the author of each individual marriage as well. And um, if you want to open up, you can check this out. And if, if you look at Matthew 19 in your Bibles, if you have that handy, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, this is the famous passage about um, divorce and remarriage. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Some Pharisees approached him, Jesus, and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? And it was they could have divorce in the Old Testament through uh, Moses. He said in reply, Have you not read from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. And this is the key. Therefore, what God has joined, no human being must separate. 
So looking at that passage, looking at the Gospels, the words of Christ, who is it that unites the couple? God. I mean, isn't that amazing to think about that when Jesus says what God has joined? He didn't say, you know, you can't break up this relationship they have. He didn't say that. What God has joined. When they exchange consent, God himself intervenes in the hearts and souls of Christian spouses. And through his divine goodness, he establishes a sacramental bond between them. The Catechism teaches, the consent by which the spouses mutually give and receive one another is sealed by God himself. That is a powerful thing, you know, that, that, that exchange is sealed by God himself. I don't have the, the quote, but my wife was telling me something that um, we were talking about this, this talk. And she said that she heard a, a statement from John Paul II where he, he, he described this by saying something to the effect that, that in marriage, God knits your souls together, knits together the, the souls of the, cu- of the couple. So in a similar way to, um, to the calling that God uh, issues to, to men to become priests or to, to the deacons or for um, men or women to become religious, in a similar way, God calls men and women to enter into the sacrament of marriage, to enter into this vocation. It truly is a calling from God, you know, and it has a specific mission. Um, There's a special plan for married couples in God's design. Through that sacrament, they're given a special mission. They are called, in and through their marriage, to be living witnesses of the love of Christ in the world. That's what marriage is all about, to be living witnesses of Christ's love in the world. And it, it's not, it doesn't have to be lofty and wonderful and, you know, and holy. And obviously everybody, I mean, on the reality side of marriage, you know, every married couple has disagreements and, and arguments and all that kind of stuff. But what we're called to do as, as, as Christian married couples is to be witnesses of God's love. And that's a tough witness sometimes, you know. But in just the everyday ways, everyday living, people should look at us and be reminded and inspired uh, that God loves us. Um, We're called to draw people into the mystery of God's love, to be living gospels, to be living witnesses of the good news of God's love in the world. That's the the heart of the Christian call of marriage. And it definitely is a demanding call. Um, I I actually was at this, um, years and years ago when I was still in the seminary, I was at a vocations talk, and I remember they had different speakers come. They had... It's kind of like what we do in a way. They had a priest talk about the priesthood and the religious sister talk and they had a married couple talk. And I don't remember anything anybody said except for one comment. The uh, the one comment that the the wife said, she was talking about marriage and she said, marriage is a life of sacrifice. You know, that was the comment that I remember. I'm like, wow, that really really struck me. And that, I just, that's so true, you know, that, that marriage really is. It's a life of giving up ourselves for our spouse, of loving our spouse and loving our children if we have children. Love is really what ties it all together. Um, in our culture, as we know, that sometimes love is very shallow. You know, you have this in love thing and, you know, in, in the flutters and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, we, we really are called to, to have a deeper love, a more mature love. If we want our marriages and relationships to last, they need to blossom into that mature love because the in-love feeling, as any married couple knows, the in-love feeling comes and goes. And for some couples, it goes more than it comes. You know? <laughs> but, um, but that's not the solid bedrock for the relationship. Um, just kind of wrapping things up, I have a, a list of just some ideas. And it's just some tips, things that I picked up over the years, you know, how to make marriage last on the more practical side. And I, I wish I had more time to go into this stuff, but I'm just going to run through this real quick. The very first thing is put God at the center. God has to be at the center of marriage. Um, you know, go to Mass every Sunday, every Sunday. Uh, make use of the sacrament of confession. Pray together as a spouse, as a, you know, as spouses, as couples, as a family, uh, by yourself. God has to be at the center, you know, if you want your marriage to thrive. The second one, make your commitment to your marriage rock solid. Before I got married, before my wife and I got married, um, I remember reading about different things and, there was one person, I think it was actually Dr. James Dobson from Focus on Family, who's not Catholic, but he had a lot of good stuff about families. And uh, one of the things he said, I, I think it was him, who said that, um, that divorce can never be a word, it can't be a reality for you. My wife and I, when we approached marriage, we, were, we looked at it that perspective and said, you know what, divorce does not exist for us. Um, I mean, you have to have that rock-solid commitment, I'm getting married for life, and that's, that's where it is. Number three, follow the church's guidelines regarding sexuality. We'll look into that later, get into that more in depth, you know, 
of um, what the problem with contraception is and all that stuff. Um, number four, develop communication skills. I thought about writing that like three or four times. Develop communication skills. Develop communications. Use communication skills. Anyway, that is so crucial to learn how, especially for women, men and women, I mean, uh, despite what our culture wants to say, men and women really are different. Hopefully you all know that, you know, because there's a big movement in our culture to say men and women aren't different. There's no differences, but they, they obviously look at life very differently. Um, Number five, spend quality time with your spouse, obviously. Number six, strive to be a better person yourself. If you want to be a good married couple, you have to be a better person just yourself, you know. Um, so anyway, there's, there's that. Number seven, deepen your understanding and ability to love your spouse. And here's some things to think about and pray over. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Sometimes it has a feeling, sometimes it doesn't. Love is a choice. You know, you make that choice. Love entails sacrifice. You know, it, 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 it's, it's definitely a, a giving. I mean, it's love is, you know, being in love and having being married is a beautiful life-giving relationship and a, a wonderful reality, but it does have a, 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 a sacrificial dimension to it. And love is patient. Love is kind. That's um, from St. Paul. I look that up. That'd be a great thing to pray over. Number eight, learn to compromise and work together with money. Money's a big factor with marriages. Uh, speak respectfully to your spouse and about your spouse. That's a great little tip. The last one, fight fair. You know, basically what that's referring to is that, you know, every couple disagrees, every couple has arguments. Um, we always need to learn to respect each other and to not, you know, not go ballistic and be extremely crazy and disrespectful in, in our disagreements and arguments and all that good stuff. Okay, I am actually way out of time, so um, if anybody has any questions, does anybody have any questions or anything you want to throw out to Kathy? Do you have anything you want to announce? Or?